Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous program that has been dedicated to trying to encourage all of us, you and me too, to become more and more involved with this book, the Bible? The Bible, which is the Word of God. We make no apologies for this because the Bible is the Word of God. There's no other book like it in the world. And it is super important because it is God's law book. God's law book to the human race. The law book is not just some of the verses in the Bible. It is the whole Bible. All Scripture, the Bible says, is given... Uh, uh, by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching and for correction. That's the nature of the law, is to correct us. And, of course, the nature of the law also is that it provides the, the remedy or the penalty when we break the law. And, unfortunately, the Bible also, as the law books, gets deeply into that. And uh, it's deadly serious. It's deadly serious because it isn't the law of the land that we're breaking. It is the law of God. And it is effectively rebellion against God himself when we commit sin. And because we're all sinners, no exceptions, me and you and everybody else are sinners by nature, we're, we have a problem, a great problem, uh, because God's law book declares that, that Christ is coming as the judge of all the earth. And from everything we know from the timeline that God gives us in the Bible, we're very, very close to that time when Christ appears to bring judgment. But, but, and this is the wonderful, wonderful news. Right at this time in history, there's a great multitude which no man can number that are being saved. God has a marvelous and wonderful salvation plan going on. And we can learn all about that, too, just from the Bible. Now, as we send the gospel all over the world, we're really trying to blanket every continent, every nation with the gospel so that every human being is as close to hearing about the Bible and learning something from the Bible as they are to a shortwave radio or to their uh, computer where they can listen on uh, Internet. Uh, and, uh, and that's how, that's how uh, it is developing in the world today. And from this, we know God is saving a great multitude. Well, we have a question here from South Africa. Long ways away from here, but here is a listener who's asking the question, what about the people of Israel? That is the Israel who lived uh, during the days of the old, when the Old Testament was being written. Uh, who, how did God uh, make their sins to be forgiven? In other words, what was God's gospel program for them and you know as a that's a pretty good question because there are lots of theologians and preachers that uh, really believe that god had one kind of a salvation plan for the people of the old testament and another plan for the church age and that just can't be of course because there is only uh, all human the whole human race we're all people created in the image of god and we all, as sinners, have to make the payment of eternal damnation if we are to be to come right with God. And the only way that payment can be made is if Christ has, has made the payment for us. We read in, for example, in Deuteronomy 10 of the Old Testament, as God is speaking to Old Testament Israel, He is saying in verse 16, Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. Now, the foreskin of the heart means that, and to be circumcised means to cut off your sins. Get rid of your sins. Well, how are they going to do that? And we read in Deuteronomy 30, where God says in verse 6, 
And Jehovah thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love Jehovah thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. In other words, it is God who actually has to save them. That is why he said in Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new spirit. No different than uh, it is than that which has to happen to a New Testament person who is uh, uh, who is going to be saved by Christ. And and uh, of course, then the natural question is, well, now wait a minute, wait a minute, Christ did not go to the cross to pay for sins until about 2,000 years ago. And this is talking about people who lived 3,500 years ago. How in the world can it be that Christ paid for their sins? And the Bible gives us the answer. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, for example, God says that Christ is the Lamb slain, from the foundations of the earth. Christ is the great I Am. He is the eternal God who is the ever-present one. And so the washing power of Christ as he paid for sins that actually took place when Christ went to the cross actually reached back all the way to the day that Adam and Eve fell into sin in the Garden of Eden. Already, the God's salvation plan was available to those that God planned to save. And so there is no difference. Israel, of ancient Israel, had to become saved through the blood of Christ. That is, through the fact that Christ gave his life for them just exactly as we uh, are to be saved as, uh, by the fact that Christ had given his life for us. And, of course, he has only done that for those that he planned to save, those who were elected of God. Well, thank you, South Africa, for that question. And now shall we go to our first caller on our telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. I just have a comment. Uh, I heard an, uh, a caller kind of reprimand you last week, and I know you take these criticisms very well, and so I'm not asking you to placate to me for them, but I am very happy whenever I hear your voice on the radio. And please don't be bashful about using your voice. One thing I'm assured of when I hear your voice is we're getting a well-studied gospel and an accurate gospel. Thank you, Mr. Campion. Keep up the good work. God bless. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, good evening, Brother Camping. Um, I've got a question on Amos chapter 5, um, verse uh, 11 uh, through 13. Amos um, chapter 5. Let's read those verses. Turn your radio off, please. That'll help. Uh, J- Amos 5, uh, verse 11. For as much... For as much, therefore, as your treading is upon the poor, and ye take from him burdens of wheat, ye have built houses of hewn stone, but ye shall not dwell in them. Ye have planted pleasant, pleasant vineyards. Is this the passage you're talking about? Yes, sir. But ye shall not drink wine of them, for I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. They afflict the just. They take a bribe, and they turn aside the poor in the gate from their right. Therefore, the prudent shall keep silence in that time, for it is an evil time, and so on. Now, what, what is your question about this? Um, does it have a pl- application today? Um, I, I see a lot of houses in my part of the country being built 5,000 square feet, 10,000 square feet that are second and third homes for people. Um, Can a Christian in good conscience have two or three homes 
uh, using all these resources. Well, excuse me, the Bible doesn't get into that. Uh, that uh, uh, We might, uh, as we read the Bible uh, as an earthly story, and remember God wrote the Bible as a parable, as an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, and we have to look at the spiritual meaning of this. The problem is that God here is faulting those who are bringing the gospel, uh, that they are really to build the house of God, that is the kingdom of God, by being faithful in declaring the whole truth of the Bible. But in order to feather their own nests, in order to, uh, to advance their own uh, earthly ideas of what they think is important, uh, preachers and Bible teachers are teaching a gospel that does not build the house of God. It builds uh, the uh, houses of, of, of false gods, of, of false doctrine. Of, uh, it, it builds spiritual palaces that, are, that will never bring to salvation. And so it leaves them, uh, it leaves the people... Uh, bereft of of the uh, bread of life, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the water of life, who is that is the water of the gospel, and uh, and it's it, God is really underscoring what an enormous sin this is. Now the fact is that there are people who are rich and build more homes or whatever. That's the nature of man. You know, this world is really. Uh, what he thinks he uh, is all important, the here and now, uh, but the Bible is very clear, and we know this to be so, that when death overtakes these individuals, or the end of the world overtakes them, they can't take one penny with them. Uh, they're only deceiving themselves. And uh, But on the other side of the coin, it, God is neither telling us we have to try to live in a situation where we all stand equally, we all live in the same size house and have the same uh, amount of income and so on. The Bible doesn't teach that anywhere. fact is, if you really like to learn uh, what the Bible has to say about these things, read again the parable of Luke 16, where you have the rich man, who has all of the that what this world might offer and yet he did not have salvation and he ends up in hell and on the other hand is the poor man Lazarus who had nothing who had the dogs licked his sores and he ate out out of the garbage pail so to speak and yet when he died he had everything he was in Abraham's bosom, and so the scale of justice w- was was more than balanced. In other words, what we have physically in this world doesn't mean a thing insofar as what we might have spiritually. Right. Um, and, you know, the, the chapter begins saying uh, something to the effect the virgin daughter is fallen, and I guess... Um, you know the context is often important for interpreting uh, a particular passage. Um, and um, we'll see the virgin daughter of Israel. God calls uh, His body of believers. That is, in Old Testament days, it was the nation of Israel. Uh, since the time of the cross until the end of the church age, it was the local congregations, and uh, and. Uh, uh, they uh, became they were externally representing the kingdom of God, and God did use that kind of a phrase, O virgin daughter of Israel, but uh, uh, she is forsaken upon her land. In other words, even though God gave them the, gave both ancient Israel as well as the church age enormous blessings of various kinds, the blessing of the gospel, the blessing of uh, of uh, seeing the possibility of salvation and so on. Nevertheless, because of their uh, rebellion in that they wanted what this world could offer rather than what God is is really uh, telling them to do, they are going their own way, and so God's judgment comes upon them. Right. Um, can I ask another uh, well, go, uh, interpretation? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, Matthew 5 to 7, uh, brother, uh, you know, Jesus Christ on the Sermon on the Mount, 
um, gives many teachings, many hard sayings that uh, you don't hear preached about much. He says, lay not up for yourself treasures. He says, um, uh, that you resist not evil, that if someone smites you on one side of the cheek, cheek turn to him the other. Do good to your enemy, bless, bless them. And, and in the end of the, the passage, you know, Matthew 5 to 7, he says, the wise man is the one who follows my sayings, and he is the one who, can, who will be able to withstand the storm when it comes. Would you say his teachings apply that whole that whole beatitude section? Uh, would you say the conditions for being the wise man who builds his house on the rock is the one who follows J Jesus Christ's teaching? Well, the fact is, you see, uh, uh, Matthew five to seven is just an integral part of the Bible message, and the Bible message teaches that the real important thing for life is our relationship with Christ and that God has given us the rules by which we can know uh, what God's will is and we are to follow those rules and then we are the wise. In fact, if, if God indeed does save us, then we are inter eternally wise. Then we uh, have uh, have uh, received eternal life, and and uh, uh, we have to wait upon God to know whether He is going to save us or not. But He does. Like in our day, there's great hope because there's a great multitude that are being saved. But again, it it is not that as we try to follow the rules of the Bible that this is going to get us saved. That can't be. That we, there's nothing we can do to get ourselves saved, but it, can, it will put us in an environment where God can save us if that is his plan, because the faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And uh, the first thing, if anybody is really concerned about his relationship with God, we ought to start uh, seriously reading the Bible and praying, Oh, Lord, help me to be obedient to your will and follow your rules. I know that that is not going to get me saved, but I know that uh, that 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 is what you are commanding and and i don't i i know that it's sin that's sending me into hell and oh lord could it be as i obey your commands uh one of the commands is that i am to pray that i might become saved and oh lord help me that is it possible that you will have mercy on me also and so on but thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Camping. Yes. Uh, I was reading the book of Leviticus. Yes. And in chapter 18, I, I was surprised to see in um, verse um, 22, I, I mean, I don't understand uh 22 and 23 is... Well, is, you're, you're talking about Leviticus 18? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's very plain. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. In other words, God is condemning homosexuality as a grievous sin. He's saying it is abom abom abomination. Then, verse 23, Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. In other words, you are not to try to have uh, uh, sexual intimacy with a dog or with a lamb or with any any beast that, that uh, you might uh, be with. That also is a, an abomination. And that's, that's, in other words, God has created the desire to have sexual intimacy for the marriage relationship and only for that. It's in between, it's when... It is the the uh, uh, body chemistry that God has put within mankind in order to assist in developing uh, the intimacy and the love that should be found within the marriage relationship. I was just uh, blown away because I didn't know uh, this um, this beast thing. Uh, well, but this I've never is heard a, of that. Well, but that's the nature of the Bible. We constantly will find truth. The more we read the Bible, 
the more we will learn what God has to say to us. And and the Bible is uh, is exquisite in its uh, in its broad uh, spectrum of laws that God gives us that God wants us to know about. And so uh, this is one of those laws. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Harold. Yes. Yes, um, my question is uh, in, in the Bible, in the book of Exodus and in parts of Revelation, um, the Bible speaks about locusts as uh, as instruments of judgment. And it, John the Baptist came, it's, the Bible says that he came eating uh, locusts and wild honey. Well, what is the significance of the locusts? Well, you see, the uh, the uh, I think we can understand it this way, and you are correct, of course, in looking for a spiritual meaning to this. But the word of God is a two-edged sword. It it is a the savor of life unto life and of death unto death. The word of God, in other words, brings spiritual life. The word of God also is uh, is the law of God that indicates judgment on those who disobey the law. Now, uh, when we... uh, 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 The fact is that when we imbibe the law of God, that is, when we are listening carefully and and, uh, and, uh, uh, trying to be obedient to the Word of God, we are, as it were, eating it. In fact, remember Jesus said, He is the bread of life, I am the bread of life, and uh, and He's the very essence of the gospel. And yet, though, we must always remember the gospel is a two-edged sword. All right. Honey, in the Bible, is a figure of salvation. We read again repeatedly in the Old Testament that the land of Canaan, which typified the kingdom of God, was a land of milk and honey. Milk and honey. That is, it was a land in which salvation could be found. That's spiritually speaking. That uh, And uh, the land uh, uh, is uh, actually the kingdom of God. But locusts have to do with the judgment of God. And so the kingdom of God has to do Uh, which is represented by the Word of God and presented by the Word of God, is typified by locusts and honey. And John the Baptist came as an announcer of the Word of God. He came to announce the Lord Jesus as the Lamb of God. And when he said the Lamb, it meant that uh, Jesus was being announced as the one who would bear the judgment of God. And so you can see why God uh, emphasizes that he ate locust and wild honey. Well, that was his physical food out in the wilderness uh, uh, where he lived a somewhat of a nomadic, strange life. Nevertheless, God is focusing on that to indicate a spiritual reality that his source of strength was the whole word of God. Yes, I, I, and one more question. Yes. Yeah, that that's that. Uh, I definitely agree there. That's it's it's still a bit strange when you think about it physically, but you know maybe the uh, locusts were nutritious. But spiritually, we understand that with the honey. Uh, but also in the Book of Revelations, I don't have my Bible in front of me. Uh, it talks about there's a portion there where it talks about during the tribulation period, where three unclean frogs, I believe, come. Out of the mouth, uh, I think it's out of the mouth, or they Reve- come out, Reve- the unclean frogs. Revelation chapter 16, we read in verse 13, And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Now, what are these three frogs represent? First of all, the number three 
if uh, if it has any spiritual meaning, and certainly it does in this context, it has to do with God's purpose. Purpose. Uh, frogs were an unclean animal, and and have to do with uh, that which is unclean, that which is, has to do with something that is uh, under the wrath of God, and uh, this comes in other words it's god's purpose that from the mouth of the dragon and the dragon is satan himself who is also called in this context god gives him three uh, names or three uh, uh, positions he is called the beast he's out of he's called the dragon and he's called the false prophet but ultimately it's all uh, the same one, it is Satan who comes uh, as the Antichrist and to rule, uh, to uh, uh, be in charge of the local congregations once Christ has abandoned them. And, uh, and uh, all together, this is the work of Satan. Now it says he comes working miracles. And indeed, this, this is literally true in our day as we see in false in many false areas, that is, false church areas, where they have uh, they have twisted the Bible to set up their own kind of a gospel, where people are falling over backwards, a true miracle. It's a supernatural event, where people are receiving supernatural messages in visions and in tongues. And again, if it is supernatural, it is a miracle. It is something that has no... Uh, no uh, reasonable um, uh, uh, explanation by the things that we know about. It is supernatural. And God has allowed Satan to do these things in our day in order that he might, uh, he might uh, 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 assist God in preparing the world for judgment. That is, uh, as he does these things, it causes more and more people to run after him and uh, thinking that they are serving Christ when in actuality they are being drawn deeper and deeper into the clutches of Satan. Yes. Mr. Camping, one more quick, one more quick uh, uh, question here. And, uh, you know, I, I'm in agreement with you and, and concerning the end. And, and obviously we... we uh, the year 2011 and possibly the month, 20, the month of September, we, we know that we have to continue to study the Bible and wait on the Lord, but there, there is great... Oh, hold on just a minute. I'll be right back with you right after this message. As we continue, we have a caller on the line. Now, what was your question? Well, I, I'm in agreement with you concerning the time of, of uh, the history of the world and, and what the biblical calendar... and. And, and I do agree that there is a great probability that, that we are very, very close to the end. But, you know, with everything that's happening in the world today and as we draw closer to that year 2011, do you believe or would you say that, you know, looking at the Scriptures, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of Scripture that talk, that, that, that describe different things that, that are going to happen through, throughout time, but as we get closer, maybe closer to September or the last three or four months of that year, do you, do you believe or would you say that there might be some changes, uh, more dramatic changes in the earth? Uh, well, I, for, or, first, first of all, uh, um, we know that the Bible is focusing on God's salvation plan, that which is spiritual. Now, uh, one big item that will not change is that the local congregations that had been for 1955 years the external representation of the kingdom of God upon this earth will never flourish again as such a, a representation. They will remain under the judgment of God. Uh, that is, God will continue his his preparation of those people that remain there and insist on remaining there and preparing them for their turn at the judgment throne of God. Secondly, uh, the fact that Satan has been loosed and, and God has given people up to sin, as we read in Romans chapter 1, uh, so that sin uh, is, is uh, 
uh, uh, going wild everywhere. Man, everyone appears to be doing what is right in his own eyes. That is not going to change. That will go right on, right to the very end. If anything, it will become more sinful. Uh, thirdly, the fact that in the closing 17 years that we learn this as we study the timeline that God offers in the Word of God, as God is uh, saving a great multitude which no man can number, that that also is in full swing today and will continue right up until the last day when Christ appears on the clouds of glory and it is the actual end of time. Now, those are the three major events, major events, are all-inclusive events that encompass the whole earth and they're all in motion and there's not to be any change. No, so, so there are those, excuse me, there are those who are looking for maybe an increase in war or increase in uh, earthquakes or, or uh, other, uh, uh, other phenomena and natural phenomenon. I do not find anything like that in the Bible. I, I, I think that the three major events that which all have to do with spirituality and spiritual relationships with God are, are in full swing and will continue right to the end. But thank you for calling and sharing. And now before we go to our next caller, we got another letter from our mission group that are uh, working in the uh, state of Punjab, India. And uh, this is from last Friday, uh, where we read, uh, this, is, this was the second full day of track distribution in this bustling city of Amritsar. Uh, incidentally, that's one of the oldest cities in the world, and we are a little bit behind in receiving letter, these letters from them because the, uh, uh, they're somewhat, uh, it's somewhat antiquated also, the situation there insofar as being able to send these kind of things. But we're, great, we're grateful to the Lord that we have some more information. It goes on. We continued our efforts by visiting some of the many markets and shopping areas around the city and hospitals. One of our teams set out on foot, distributing trucks at several busy locations within close proximity of the hotel, and reported as follows. There were enough pedestrian and vehicular traffic to make for a successful day for sharing the words of life to these dear people. Many were interested, reception, and uh, receptive, and showed reverence for the Bible. And we met quite a few people of all ages, more young than old, that professed Christianity. One young woman on staff of our hotel was very proud to confess that she too is a Christian and one of our ambassadors witnessed to her. Another team went to a very busy marketplace in the downtown of Amritsar where the reception was much improved compared to yesterday, perhaps because the word had gotten around. So good was the response that while we were weaving in and out of the traffic to share the tracks with the auto and and the manual rickshaw, rickshaw drivers and their occupants and bicyclists and motorcyclists so that they stopped at the few traffic lights in the city, there would be some pedestrian uh, tapping you on the shoulder to also ask for a tract. We discovered that quite a few of the people were out-of-towners and did not understand the Punjabi language, which was the the natural language of uh, um, Ritsar, and the alt and the alternative request would be for either Hindi or Urdu or even English. Thankfully, we were able to fulfill many of these requests. In the afternoon, we went to another marketplace, which was a few blocks away from the Golden Temple. Many tourists were on their way to visit the shrine, some Englishmen, 
a few Americans of Indian descent, and even two Australians. It was wonderful to see that even these sometimes spiritually nonchalant Westerners were receptive to the word of truth. One man said he lives in Houston, Texas, and knows the family radio. And though he knew uh, Punjabi, I was proud to be uh, 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 was was proud that he was able to read English, and he said, "I don't want the Punjabi track. Please give me the English track." Well, may it be that the Lord would work in this man's heart that he too might be a become a soldier for the gospel of Christ. The afternoon ended on a very successful note, and the team felt happy that they were able to distribute many tracts, some Bibles and other literature. We were also glad to be able to respond to the continual questions, What is this, and why are you here? by saying, This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are here to... uh, to warn you that he is coming back soon to judge the world. Are you ready to meet him? The remaining team visited four of Amritsar's main hospitals, and this is their report. We rented a taxi cab for the day, making it easy to load up with four boxes of Punjabi Bibles and about 10,000 tracks. Though we were not able to get into the hospitals, by God's mercy, the hospital administration allowed us to witness the word on their grounds. As we distributed to the steady flow of traffic in and out of the hospitals, many times others would approach us wanting tracts and Bibles. We discovered that we could stay in one location, and as word spread Uh, And as word spread as to the nature of the tract and the availability of Bibles in the native Punjabi language, people were gravitating toward us for the word of grace. One woman came from the hospital's waiting room and requested a Bible for her mother-in-law who was still inside. We could see through the window that immediately her mother-in-law started reading her new Bible. We witnessed this wonderful sight, people avidly reading the tract in the Bibles many times during the course of the day. Could it be that those whom we saw voraciously partaking of this bread of life, that among them there could be a great multitude that no man can number that also might become saved? With the myriad vehicular traffic, On the busy streets around these hospitals, naturally, there were many traffic jams. And this provided ample opportunity for placing the precious gospel in many outstretched hands. Many, perhaps out of curiosity, but thankfully, they are responding favorably to the true gospel of grace that is now in the palm of their hands, a tract and a Bible. We would like to thank the many listeners who continue to contribute to the purchase of Bibles for these mission trips. To see these dear people receive these precious gifts with such sincere gratitude is such a great blessing. Tonight we had four guests at our Bible study, and praise the Lord. Our 19-year-old Sikh friend from yesterday was again in attendance. All praise to God that he has condescended to give us his wonderful words of life. All right, and then we have uh, the the information from uh, this uh, last Saturday. Today is our last full day in Amritsar. In Amritsar, Turk, excuse me, Amritsar, India. It rained all night last night and unto this morning, so we all had a very late start around 10 o'clock. And this worked well for us, given that the markets and places of business do not open until around 10.30 a.m. One team took a taxi intending to go to a different market in the downtown area. But given that things were a bit slow there, we walked a little further up the street, a main thoroughfare with many stores, shops, and eateries. 
by God's providence, we landed at the entrance of a girls' college, which apparently has a very large population. We were not allowed entrance, however, into the complex, but we stood on both corners of the very busy street and were able to capture the attention of many women and teenage girls, the majority of them maneuvering their motor scooters and motorcycles with unbelieving dexterity in the labyrinth of traffic. The distribution uh, uh, in this situation progressed at a steady pace until two ambassadors were surrounded by about ten mendicants most of them little girls, and this was impeding their progress and became bothersome to the students entering the, and exiting the college, so much so that the guard at the gate asked us to leave, strange enough. The rickshaw was not in sight, but we walked back a few blocks and was able to find one and asked him to take us to a place where there were many people and be and he took us to a large intersection called the Gandhi Gate, one of the main entrances to the Golden Temple. We stood at this busy intersection for about 45 minutes, and then it began to rain, and we decided that, that was not conducive to track distribution, so we went back to, hotel, to uh, the hotel. After lunch, as the rain ceased, we returned to the Gandhi Gate location. Though very cold and bleak, we nonetheless braved the weather and had a very productive afternoon sharing the gospel of salvation. Now, in Amritsar, as in all of India, Saturday is a school day, and another team went to a busy intersection adjacent to a girl's girl school. The students of this school were the main segment for the team's distribution efforts, the other being people of all walks of life, from rickshaw drivers to businessmen and professionals. The sharing of the true gospel progressed nicely until this team as well was hampered by the rain and returned to the hotel. In the afternoon, they went to a local family-oriented park where people engaged in various recreational activities. The reception continued to be great, with the students also asking for English tracks, and very few tracks were discarded. As you'll notice, as we read these letters, we're really getting, uh, it's helping us to kind of walk with the, our team members and getting a kind of a, a view of how it would be if you or I were there. We would be also going to this school or going to that hospital or going to that downtown corner. What would happen when we got there? Well, as we listen to this report, we get some idea. We can kind of empathize a little bit with these team members as they are very faithfully and patiently doing the will of God. Another uh, team leader had this to say. Today we went about 11 miles outside of Amritsar to a large modern hospital, and the administration was kind enough to allow us to share tracts and Bibles in the Punjabi language on the premises. On the way back to town, we came upon a drum band in action and decided to stop upon seeing a sizable crowd always an appealing sight to us missionaries. We found out it was a wedding and shared our tracks and materials with these people, recognizing that they too needed the only gospel that would allow them to be present at the great wedding feast of the bride and the lamb. Continuing on, we came to a heavily trafficked crossroad and where there were a lot of street vendors. We were having a wonderful time sharing, but then the rains came, and our efforts became counterproductive, and uh, so we dejectedly left the scene. After traveling a few kilometers on our way back to the hotel, we were in the midst of a huge traffic backup, only defined by God's providence that it was a large middle school dismissing their students for the day and parents picking them up. Beside these school children and their parents, there were scores of people who were caught in the traffic jam. Thus, this wonderful 
opportunity was provided for track distribution, and we most definitely grabbed it as our English tracks went like hotcakes, this being the preference of the students. Despite the dismal weather, this turned out to be a very glorious day, one that could not have been better if if we had planned it. But thankfully, God is in control, and everything occurs in the fullness of His timing and to all to His glory. Tonight, in our last night in Amritsar, we had about 10 attendees, including, again, our 19-year-old Sikh friend. We had a wonderful time praising the Lord and studying His Word, and the visitors were very attentive and thankful, and thanked us for for evening, for coming, rather, across continents to their country to bring the gospel of redemption and reconciliation. And so we are so thankful that God is great in His faithfulness. And so in Christian love, we uh, hear it signed the Family Radio Mission Group in Punjabi, or in Punjab, India. And so we, again can thank the Lord that all is going well, that these this benighted country, like so many countries of the world that so desperately need the gospel, well, so many, every country of the world, it too is getting a special emphasis because on these tracks, uh, our, our, uh, our shortwave uh, frequencies are given where they can follow up if they have an interest in what they're reading on these tracks uh, and our our uh, internet address is given, our web page is given, if they are able to access that. And so let's keep praying for them and praying for our missionaries that all may continue to go so well in India. But right now, we're going to go back to our callers on our telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Hello. This uh, Mr. Campy. Yes. Um, I, I, yeah, I've... Just, I've been listening to your program off and on over the past 10, 12 years, and I've read some of your books. And uh, I guess during all this time, there's a big question that stands out for me, and I'm just wondering why you don't seem to mention any of the early writings in, in Christianity from the first centuries. I mean, there's a lot there we can learn from, and I'm just wondering why that's not talked about by you. Well, uh, for for a couple of reasons, one is that uh, we don't we don't have that much. There is quite a bit. We on our on our for example on our um, book reading program, we read books that have to do with uh, early missionaries and early theologians from time to time. Uh, we uh, that that does happen on family radio. But in so far as our open forum program is concerned and our teaching programs, we're not focused on what what others have believed in the past. We're focused on what does the Bible teach. Now, some of the things of the past were done correctly. A lot of things were not done correctly. It's not our role right now to straighten all of them out or to indicate who we thought was right or who was wrong. It's our job to come with the truth. And so we're constantly praying, Oh, Lord, teach us for what the Bible presently is saying. And the other fact is, you know, that we're living at a, to- at a different time in history. Uh, the, until about 50 years ago, while everything that God wanted mankind eventually to know is written in the Bible and it's been there for about 2,000 years. It's only in the last 50 years that God has really begun to open up our spiritual eyes to all kinds of, of wonderful truths that have never been known in the past. And, and uh, so we are very busy uh, trying to teach these or call uh, attention to our listeners to these truths that are in the Bible. But there, at the same time, there is so much that that is ignored from the past that that never gets talked about, you know. And, and 
But in the see, gospel, it talks about you know building on the foundation, and Christ is the foundation, and then you know then the apostles put another layer on there, and and no, no, no the the foundation is Christ, and Christ is the Word of God. We build on that foundation, but if we have to go back, and you know, I I often thought about this. 40 years ago, I used to think, you know, if I went to a seminary, and uh, and I remember when I was in high school, I, I had a dear pastor who suggested to me, he saw that I was very interested in the Bible, even at that time, and he says, why don't you go to seminary and become a pastor? I must say that I really never, never had any interest to do that but later on I began to think about that those seminary students they have to read uh, what uh, what John Calvin said what Martin Luther said what Augustine said what this one and what that one has said in the past and try to understand why they said what they said and frankly frankly uh, 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 some of what was said was true, but a lot was not true. Uh, and yet they would have to spend hours and hours of time trying to figure out what these men said. And I've often, I always thought, why, why go in that direction when we have the fountainhead of truth? We have the Bible. Why do we have to, first of all, figure out what this what this theologian of the past concluded, when we can go right to the Bible and pray that God will open our spiritual eyes. Uh, there's, you know, uh, time's a wasting, so to speak. We, we, uh, why, why, why uh, use up our time trying to understand man's thinking when we can use that valuable time trying to figure out what is God's thinking? Because that's what the Bible is. That is God's thinking. And so it's far, far wiser in my judgment to stay right in the Word of God, stay with the Bible, and let God guide us into truth. I, I agree with you. I mean, I, the, the teachers, the, the names that you mentioned there are not the ones that I that come to mind for me. Um, you know, there, there are people that have really, uh, in, the, in the old days, dedicated their lives completely to God, and, and they would but, never do something to... Uh, uh, disseminate falsehood. Oh, excuse and if you me. look at their lives, I mean, they're just, they're incredible people, and, and there's, there's, and there's yeah, so much. No, excuse me. No, wait a minute. They're incredible. We can think of them as incredible. Remember, they were human beings like you and me. And they were limited in their understanding of the Bible, like every one of us are limited. They were living in a day when God was not opening our spirit, the spiritual eyes of, of those who were uh, trying to be theologians as he is today, opening the spiritual eyes of those who are really getting into the Word of God. And so while they may have done fine for their day, uh, that, that it won't measure up for today. We have the Bible, and and it is uh, it, it, it is makes no sense to to uh, put on an equal level uh, the writings of a theologian of years ago with that of the Bible. It says they're night and day difference in their authority, and and so we want to stick with the great authority namely the Bible. That is where the truth really is. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. Um, yes, you've had some callers um, calling, saying some things to you about, you know, the, the tulip and everything and why you've changed a little bit about what you've been saying. Um Basically, I think, you know, what, what you've taught all along has really, you know, from what I can see in the Bible, is pretty much the truth. I mean, because, you know, we really are pretty well totally deprived. Um, I mean, you look even like at Balaam, you know, it was only by God's will that Balaam didn't curse Israel, you know, that he 
actually gave them a blessing instead of a cursing. And uh, I'm sorry, when you speak right into your phone, your voice is falling away. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, no, I was just talking about, um, you know, how Balaam uh, couldn't curse God. Israel, Israel, you know, yes. except by God's will, you know. Or um, there was the situation when, uh, what was it, Shimei, that he was cursing um, David? David, yes. Yeah, and, you know, it was all only by God's will. And so it's like well, my no. understanding from the Bible is... When we do something, even if it is pleasing to God, it's God's will. You know, it's God is the one that is in power of everything. Yes, but what is the point? Uh, you know, everything in the Bible, or God allows people to sin. It doesn't make God guilty of sin. No. But, uh, but God allows men uh, free reign to, to sin, and, and, but they're only bringing themselves deeper under the judgment of God. Hold on, I'll be right back with you right after this message. We have a caller on the line who's emphasizing that God records a lot of things that people did, and, and since God allowed that, it must be God's will that they did that. Well, uh, in one sense, we could say, yes, God allowed them to do that. But remember, anything that is sinful is in rebellion against God. And it is not God's will that we are in rebellion. But God does allow that rebellion to go on uh, because he has created man in his image and, and has made man completely accountable to God. But there is finally a day of reckoning. Uh, mankind has to give an account to God of how he lived and, and will be found guilty and, and there will be a judgment. So we, uh, we, uh, we can never say that just because someone did something sinful that, uh, that uh, somehow that's all right because God has allowed it to happen. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. I uh, just have to ask you a question. Do you really believe that the local congregation are the Babylonians? The Bible teaches. It's not whether I think it, uh, or believe. It is what the Bible says, that Satan rules in the temple, and the temple is the external representation of the kingdom of God in our day, which are the local congregations. And he is seated there. He is ruling there. In other words, God has installed Satan there as, a, an, a, as an angel of light. As Wait a, a minute. As, as, a, excuse me, me. as an antichrist in order that those within the churches, while they think they're serving Christ, are actually serving Satan. How dreadful can that be? the Bible you can find that well the Bible tells us that in uh, in uh, uh, Revelation or in uh, first Thessalonians chapter uh, let me turn to that first Thessalonians chapter 4 okay or, or excuse me not second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2 is what I really want second Thessalonians chapter 2 where we read that God is saying, uh, 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 verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, talking about the uh, judgment day which we are now in, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes, and that man of sin is, is Satan, uh, uh, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God. Now, where is there a temple today, a temple of God? There, it's the not, temple I, of God is the, uh, the man's body. It's not the local congregation. It's not the church temple. It's the man's body. Yeah. That is the temple of God. That's the temple of the Holy Ghost that you can go and read in the uh, Gospel of John, chapter 14, and verse 14, 15, and 16. John 14, verse 14, 15, and 16. 
Go, re- go, begin, begin from 12, 13, 14, and 15, and 14. Uh, uh, believe me, you're at, uh, John 14. Yes. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, what is that saying? What is that telling you? That Why do, why do you think go, that is go saying for, that? Go forward, because that's, that is where, where the Bible says in that chapter that the Holy Ghost becoming a realm of men and inside of the man. If the Holy Ghost is inside of the man, it's God by himself, inside of the man. Yeah, but you see, the, we have to remember that when we become saved, whether we became saved in the Old Testament days or the New Testament days, in we, New Testament. excuse me, excuse me, we are infilled by the Holy Spirit. It is God the Holy Spirit who has given us a brand new soul, a brand new spirit. As we read in Ezekiel chapter 36, where God says, I will give you a new heart. I will put my spirit within you. Uh, and, and that is a characteristic of someone who is a child of God. Now, at the time that God began the church age, uh, there were true believers Mary and Martha and uh, and the most of the apostles and and there were others who uh, a few others that had become true believers the Holy Spirit was in them and yet the Holy Spirit had not been poured out as yet now what did that mean uh, when God talked about the Holy Spirit being poured out it meant that God had a plan where a few days a few weeks after uh, well, actually, about ten days after Christ went back to heaven, God would begin his plan to evangelize the world so that wherever there were true believers gathered, as, as small as two or three in number, Christ or the Holy Spirit would be there or and Christ in the, in, uh, in the presence of the Holy Spirit because he, we can't distinguish between Christ and the Holy Spirit. They are eternal God. And God would be there to save those that he planned to save. And on that first Pentecost afternoon, there were about 3,000 who did become saved. But then we come to Matthew 24, verse uh, where it's talking about a period of great tribulation right near the end of time, and it says that uh, that uh, the abomination of desolation would be standing in the holy place. That's verse 15. Now, who is the who? Is, what is the holy place? That's the temple of God. That is where the body of believers are. That's where the Holy Spirit has been operating to to uh, to share the gospel. And and uh, and but now the abomination of desolation is there, and that's why God picks that theme up in in uh, Second uh, Th- Thessalonians chapter two, where He says in uh, in uh, uh, in He that restraineth sin. Uh, we read in verse 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only who, he that now letteth, that is restraineth, will restrain until he be taken out of the midst. Who restrains sin? God the Holy Spirit. And then shall that wicked be revealed, that is, Satan, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him who is coming against the working of Satan with all power and lying wonders. In other words, Satan comes with all power and lying wonders because he now has, is the abomination of desolation that has come into the local congregations. And that is what... And because Satan was typified by Babylon, the king of Babylon, therefore God calls the local congregations Babylon. Now, we don't have to believe this. We can say, oh, no, I don't buy it. Our church is still faithful. And so we can make up our mind. I know more than God knows. It isn't what I read in the Bible. 
uh, as I carefully check Scripture against Scripture that tells me where the truth is, I already know where the truth is, and and I can I can explain away those verses that seem to be different with what I believe. That's a terribly dangerous thing to do. And remember, in Second Corinthians 11, you you can't get around this, where God talks about Satan coming as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. Where in the world are ministers of righteousness? They're in the local congregations. They're, or they're sent out as evangelists by the local congregations. And God is saying, these are the ones that he is... Uh, uh, that's the language he's using as he's talking about those who are ministers or emissaries of Satan. We don't like it. It's awful. It's terrible. But that's what the Bible teaches us. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Harold. Yeah. Um, I would like to clarify three dates, and then I have a scripture with a question. Um, the three dates is in our calendar, October 1st, March 31st, and May 11th. Can you speak to those? I have no idea what those dates mean. Well, October 1st is Christ's birth. Um, March 31st would have been the um, crucifixion, I believe. And then May 11th would have been the ascension. Is that correct? Yeah, actually, those dates are one day off. Actually, as we have worked on that more carefully and more exactly, we find that Jesus was born on May, on October 2nd. That was the day of uh, atonement in AD, uh, B, uh, BC uh, 7. Uh, okay. And Christ was crucified on April 1. And uh, April 3 was the day when Christ went, rose from the grave. Uh, and uh, so uh, that would be, a, that would be, but, but just just give those dates uh, as if they're magic or something. No, that's not it. That has no value. Okay. Uh, and then a scripture I have to read is um, 2 Samuel 22, um, verse 20. 2 Samuel 22, verse 20. There we read uh, where uh, it's really a psalm of praise. He brought me forth also in a, into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Is that the verse? No, it's 2 Samuel 20. Was, I'm sorry, 2 Samuel um, 21. Oh, all right. Um, 20. All right, now that's... Uh, and there was yet a battle in Gath, where there was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he also was born to the giant, uh, and okay. so on. Now, what is your question? Well, that looks like a 24-digit system to me. <laughs> Do you, what's, could, you talk, could you speak to that? What would be the meaning of of that I don't know for the full spiritual meaning of that although I know the number six has to do with work God worked six days to create the heavens and the earth and if the number six has any spiritual meaning it has to do with work and this giant really represented the kingdom of Satan which is preoccupied with the idea we can do the work to get ourselves saved uh, and I think it has to uh, probably be understood along that line, but certainly not trying to tie that into a numerical system of 24 digits. But thank okay. you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Campy. How are you doing this evening? Hey, very well, thank you. I thank you, and I thank you for bringing uh, your, your Open Forum so uh, we can talk. And my name is James, and what my question is, is it's in reference to Joshua in the, in the chapter 10, when they were referring to the sun and the moon standing still. That I, I'm, day. I'm, I'm sorry, what book are you talking about? Uh, the book of Joshua. Oh, Joshua chapter 10? Yes. And yeah. the, uh, I saw on the website a while back that, I know this probably sounds ridiculous, but that the uh, what I saw on there was that 
it was a great comet that caused the Earth to stand still in its diurnal motion, and uh, not as you know, not as circumference around the sun, but in its daily, you know, daily uh, motion. Oh, you're, that it was, you're talking yeah, about I, the time when the sun stood still and the day was greatly lengthened. Yes. Yes. Now this I, is a stupendous miracle, a stupendous miracle, because the the uh, solar system uh, the sun and the moon and the planets including planet earth are a giant celestial clock that kicks away uh, all through history so that there are 365.2422 days uh, in every year uh, 24 hours in every day uh, 29.53 uh, uh, days uh, from one new moon to another, and so on, and it, and that celestial clock has to uh, has to work perfectly. Otherwise, that old time arrangement would would disappear, would change. And not only that, it has to obey all kinds of natural laws, like the law of gravity or the law of centri centrifugal force, and so on. And yet here. God, who is the creator of this giant celestial clock, interrupted all of that movement in order to make a longer day. And yet the pieces didn't fall into, uh, uh, fly away or, or get out of position or whatever. Once that lengthened day came to an end, the celestial clock continued to keep its perfect time ever since as it had been keeping perfect time until that time. So this is truly an indicator to us that the God who we serve is the God of the universe. He spoke and brought this universe into existence. There is nothing outside of his power to do. So therefore, then, uh, that rumor about the, that, it, that it was a giant comet that actually stopped that, uh, the Earth in its rotation, is actually it's just a rumor. Well, that's just a lot, that's just a speculation about a comet. There doesn't talk about a comet here at all, and God doesn't require something like that to have that happen. As a matter of fact, if it were a comet that was following natural laws, why then you would have a solar system that would have gone uh, gone bananas uh, to use a figure. In other words, it uh, it never would function properly anymore. Any more than if you took a watch and dropped it and 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 uh, you threw the uh, main spring out or or some of the parts out of alignment it wouldn't operate very well as a watch anymore uh, no no this was totally a miracle we don't have to look for any extenuating outside reasons why this did happen but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Thank you, Harold, for taking my call. Mr. Camping, I'm wondering if you could give me any information or, or your understanding of the books that the Roman Catholics have added to the Bible. I believe they're called the books of the uh, Apocrypha or something like that. Yes. So where did they come from? Well, what what time they're... in history and who wrote them? Well, there were... I think there's nine books that have, are found in the Roman Catholic Bible that is not found in our uh, in our, Eng uh, our other Bibles, like the King James Bible, and uh, they were written in that period about a hundred to two hundred years before Christ. Uh, they are not part of the Holy Canon. They are not a part of the Jewish Bible, for example. If you went into any synagogue and asked for a Jewish Bible, you would find that it's almost identical to our Old Testament. The books would be in a slightly different order, but the same material would be there. Uh, and that old, that Jewish Bible is called the Tanakh. Uh, they did not have, they do not have these nine books in because they, they are not a part of the holy canon. And, and they should never, never be under the same cover with the other books of the Bible uh, because someone might get an idea that uh, they can find some kind of God's truth in the book of Judith or the book of Maccabees or 
uh, some of the other of the nine books that is not possible. Mm. Now, because because that that church co uh, does believe that those were part of the holy canon, they are in dreadful violation of what God has declared in uh, Revelation 22, where God says we're not to add to the words of the prophecy of this book. They have deliberately added those nine books into the same cover with the other books, saying that they too are the Word of God. And that is a very grave and serious rebellion against God. Mm -hmm. one, one other question. Uh, I do some work in a nursing home, and I've been able to gather a small group of people up on the fifth floor, about 25 or 30 of us on Sundays, for Bible study uh, in the Word of God. And it seems like after I leave, there are some individuals from this faith who come in, and they're handing out uh, crucifixes, uh, rosary beads, and a lot of doctrine about worshiping uh, uh, Mary. It seems they worship Mary more than Christ. As a, as a new teacher, as a young teacher, what advice can you give me well, to uh, you, you, deal you, with this? You see, uh, 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 and what is a blessing to you uh, also we can see as a curse. How wonderful it is that we live in a land where we, where we freely can share the gospel. Just think, you are given the freedom of coming in there to share the gospel. But that means that that same freedom has to be accorded to anybody who wants to bring their kind of a gospel. That is just the nature of, 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 uh, of that kind of freedom and and the moment that any country has tried to limit the gospel or limit the kind of religion that they wanted uh, the first thing that happens is we can't share the true gospel there any longer so just be thankful that you can bring the truth now more than that uh, you're not going to get anybody saved when you right. come there to share the gospel God has to do the saving and and if he wants to uh, to apply that word to one of these individuals' hearts and save them, thank the Lord for that. Uh, on the other hand, the next people come in with their kind of a gospel, uh, and you know that that's not the gospel that God will use to save, and yet there may be those who believe that that is the truth, and you can't keep them from that. But thank okay, you. Bro. Thank you, brother. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Mr. Kansas. Yes. Um, a couple of things I want to say. I do enjoy... Could you hold for a second? My radio is on. Can I go turn it off? No, I, I, I'm sorry. Speak right into your phone. You want to really know what? Yes. Um, there are a couple of things that I want to ask you a question about. Like... Um, just now, th when this man spoke about that, uh, about the, 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 um, why the earth stands stood still. Now, I also agree that God had the power to do anything he chooses to do, um, because he's the creator of the entire universe. However, on one occasion, I remember when speaking about the, um, Noah's flood, I've heard you saying that. Um, God caused the earth to pass through some water, something or another. And um, so that is kind of a inconsistent there where you were using a scientific thing to, dis to explain that situation. Also, well, well, well uh, what scientific things are going to explain the Bible? Now tell me, when, no. you, when the Bible, when the scientific world is talking about a world that's been around for millions of years, and the Bible says very plainly that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and when we work through the calendars just from the Bible evidence and find out that the world is about 13,000 years of age, how in the world are you going to get any explanation of anything that has any truth in it from the scientific community. Since you misunderstood they... me. Excuse me. Hello? Yes. You misunderstood what I was saying. I was saying just now, this man was speaking about, he was saying that um, there was some scientific explanation for 
uh, why the earth still... Oh, oh yeah. Joshua chapter 10. Right, right. So I'm just saying that man was saying that. And I am saying to you that I also believe that God doesn't need any intervention to do whatever he chooses to do. I believe that God can let the earth stand still on his own if he chooses to. However, I'm saying that on a previous occasion, some, some time back, when speaking about Noah's flood, I've heard you say, you, you, you explained it saying that God caused the earth to pass through, it was something like a water, something another, uh, I forgot the terminology, but it was you who said that, that the earth, yeah. God caused the earth to pass through some water system. Yeah. I, I, I agree, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and you are very correct in reminding us of that, that I don't, I don't uh, mind that at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, we don't know that that was absolutely true, but we do know that there are great water clouds or, or uh, hydrogen, oxygen clouds uh, out in deep space. That we know. And we also know that water came on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and it had to come from up there. And so that um, is a... It, it excuse me. Excuse me. That does make a possibility that that is the way it was accomplished, that the windows of heavens were open, as the Bible says, uh, so that the water came. But on the other hand, uh, uh, if, there, if we didn't know anything about the possibility of water clouds out there, we'd have to say, well, then it was miraculous water. And maybe it was. Maybe it was. But uh, when it comes to the, uh, the, the long day of Joshua... Uh, there is no, there is no earthly scientific possibility. If if it were a comet, for example, that hit, that would have completely disabled the uh, the celestial clock. And and so, uh, in fact, uh, I have taught this for a long time. We don't know how it all was done at all, but we know that it did happen because God declares it so. Hello. But thank yeah. you, thank you for, for. I would like to ask you one more thing. Yes. Um, another thing, and this is not to be um, not 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 to be contradictory or anything like that, but just because I'm in search of truth myself. Uh, on certain occasions, in speaking about the Bible, um, I believe that the Bible should explain itself, and you have said that. But however, there are times when I've heard you when someone call in concerning certain passages in the Bible, and your response sometimes is, you said, I do not think that that's what's in view here. And to me, to make a statement like that is not using the Bible to explain itself, but rather using human um, thinking. Yeah, the, uh, the reason I use that kind of language is to indicate I, I am not the last word on this insofar as my human mind is concerned this is what I don't see presently but uh, on the other hand a lot of times you, you will hear me say you know uh, is from what I can read in the Bible this means this and that and this means that and I in other words I'm far more certain about that and so it's it's it is a problem just how emphatic to be but I have to say good night now. I'm sorry we can't visit longer. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.